This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Welcome everybody to this second in uh, this series of Hitchcock lectures that are being given by Jim Hudspeth, who's from Rockefeller University. Maybe I should just introduce myself. I'm Carla Schatz, and I'm in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology here at UC Berkeley. And um, I wanted to say a few words of introduction about Jim, but I'm not going to start at the very beginning because actually I realized, Jim, that we've known each other for about 29 years, which is too many years to think about, but I actually uh, knew him before he, he had an elegant white beard. He Actually, I don't think you had a beard when we first met. And uh, we met at Harvard at a medical school where we were both graduate students. And I know that um, uh, many of you were at his lecture on Tuesday, so you, you know that he's had a very distinguished career and has been at a number of very notable institutions such as Caltech and UCSF and now Rockefeller University. What I want to do today is uh, actually not tell you silly stories about when we were graduate students together, which I can do later, but um, I just wanted to, to say something about the, the kind of contribution that Jim's research has made to our understanding of uh, not just the auditory system, but mechanisms of sensory transduction in general. Um, and I, I want to put this in a kind of historical context, but in the history of our time and of neuroscience of our time, because when Jim entered this field, which was now you know almost 30 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, we really knew nothing about how sensory transduction works uh, in almost any system except I think probably for the retina. And no one had managed to make uh, recordings, electrical recordings, from hair cells. And in the, over the course of uh, the years that I've watched him work, it's really been extraordinary to just see how he has defined a question and gone after the answer in a very elegant, very creative and methodical way. So that, in fact, he was really one of the first people to manage not only to make electrical recordings from hair cells uh, and study their transduction properties, but also to design beautiful techniques for actually moving the hair cell, back, uh, sorry, moving the stereocilia, the, the, the hair itself on the cell, back and forth to study in a very quantitative way the, the process of what we would call mechanotransduction. And I know that he talked to you a good deal about that, uh, that process in the, next, in the last lecture. But if it weren't for Jim uh, and his students, and he's trained a number of really fabulous young, uh, young researchers now, if it weren't for him, uh, we wouldn't know really anything about uh, these, these sorts of, um, of, of processes in the nervous system. Uh, it was because of his creativity and the kind of approach that he took that we, that we know so much about transduction. And I don't know if he mentioned this on Wednesday, but I do know that uh, his discoveries have let us understand not only the process of auditory transduction, but also fundamental mechanisms that nerve cells use to transduce mechanosensory stimulation. And uh, finally, I'd like to just say that it's, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome him here again to give the second lecture, uh, which he calls Getting in Tune auditory frequency selectivity. So we're going to hear more about mechanisms of how the auditory, uh, how the ear works. But in addition, I have to point out that the reason you can hear me today is because um, Jim has also lent his skills to tuning up this room so that at least for the next year, <laughs> we will have good lectures in this room. So for all those reasons, I would like to welcome you, Jim, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carla. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank again the whole community here for the wonderful hospitality you've shown.
Um, I also want to particularly thank Ms. Teresa Malango, who was really the person responsible for fixing things. So if we could, let's give her a round of applause. <clears throat> Teresa makes the posters, she fixes the room, she moves the chairs, she has been doing everything, and I really want to thank her for her support throughout this. So, as Carla uh, has said, I've already defined for you the way in which hair cells, the sensory receptors of the internal ear, carry out their fundamental chore, which is that of converting mechanical inputs into electrical responses that can then be forwarded to the brain and interpreted there. And very briefly, to recapitulate what we heard the last time, a hair cell is a cylindrical cell, such as this one. It has the usual nucleus and other cytoplasmic organelles. And it's specialized in having a so-called hair bundle, this organ pipe-like protuberance from the top of the cell. Seen in a scanning electron microscope, that has this beautifully regular stacking of these fine processes called stereocilia. And when one looks at the interior of such a cell, one finds that the stereocilia are filled with actin microfilaments and that the stereocilia are linked to each other by various types of filamentous connections, particularly something called the tip link uh, occurring at the top of the hair bundle. When a mechanical force is uh, applied to this apparatus, the sliding between adjacent stereocilia, as schematized down here, increases the tension in the tip link. And we believe that the increased tension in this tip link then pulls on ionic channels at one or at both ends, and by that means opens them allowing current to flow into the cell and eliciting an electrical response. So the simple model that I presented is that mechanical stimulation causes shearing or sliding between these two stereocilia an increase in tension. That tension then yanks on the gate of this ion channel, opens it, and allows current to flow in. We further believe that adaptation to protracted stimulation takes place because this entire apparatus is capable of sliding down by that means reducing the tension in the tip link and allowing the channel to reclose. Now, this bare bones description of the mechanical sensitivity of the hair bundle is, is perfectly well and good, giving you an idea of how mechanical reception occurs in our ear. But it doesn't touch upon the most fundamental aspects of our auditory experience. Uh, in particular, the richness of our auditory world comes about, for example, from our use of hearing to detect speech and to recognize the person or persons with whom we're talking. It comes from the use of hearing <coughs> to detect music, to represent, to, to, to uh, recognize the various instruments that are participating. And really, I haven't touched at all upon how those processes come about. That's going to be the subject of today, the way in which the ear is involved in the frequency analysis of its incoming sounds. Now, to set the, the stage for that, I want to point out how very complicated this type of analysis is. I can say something simple and straightforward uh, that seems rather easy to understand, but when you actually look at how the auditory system is processing the information, it's rather appalling. So the line that I have in, in mind is the conclusion of Dylan Thomas's poem, Fern Hill, which goes, um, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, Time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. That's very clear. I don't mean the poem is particularly clear. It, it takes a lot of work, this poem. But the last line, though I sang in my chains like the sea, you would all agree on what I've said. But if you look at what information is actually in just that line, you find it's extraordinarily complex. And the representation I have on the board shows two different ways of showing that information. This top line is simply a picture of the amplitude of my voice saying that line as a function of time. And you can see it takes about two and a half seconds to utter that line. And you can see the complexity of different frequencies that are present. And you can see the rising and falling of the intensity of sound in my voice. The bottom half of the figure is what's called a sonogram, and that's what I want to focus on. The sonogram is a representation, again, with time running along the abscissa. But the vertical axis now is the frequency of various sound components. So these are high frequency sounds, these are low frequency sounds, and there are various other things in between. The intensity of the sound is also encoded here by the color of the sound. So these very bright reddish and yellow uh, tones represent particularly loud syllables. The greenish and finally the blue represent rather quieter things. So what does one make of all of this? First of all, if you examine simply the record that you would get if you looked at my voice on the oscilloscope, it's rather hard to make anything out of it. Here's the actual scansion, the parsing of it, though I sang in my chains like the sea. 
And you can see, yes, that there are some particular syllables that stand out here, ch in chains and so on. But you would have a very hard time, indeed, analyzing that record. If we now ask what is going on in the auditory system, we can see the auditory system makes use of the temporal information that I just showed you, but also strikingly of the frequency information. So let's look again at the parsing. You can see right away that there are different kinds of sounds. So the vowels re are represented by relatively low frequencies and relatively constant frequencies. So though, I are both relatively smooth curves. And you can see again this happening under the A and chains and C, okay? The consonants, by contrast, tend to be at higher frequencies, and they tend to be more erratic in shape. So the s, ch, the chain, s, there's the s at the end of that, c, and what have you. The point I want to make is that the auditory system must be doing this kind of decomposition all of the time on the fly in order to make you facilely able to understand such speech. And this seems a priori like something every day. We listen to each other all the time. But think how hard this is to do. First of all, we spend a good fraction of the first five years of our life trying to understand this stuff, right? So it takes kids a lot of time to become adept at understanding complex and arbitrary speech sounds. And still more striking is to think of how well computers have done in this regard. When computers first left government labs and began to become commonplace in the 50s and the 60s, one of the most striking promises made about them is that they would provide a wonderful means of doing instantaneous translation between languages or of taking dictation, that you would simply talk into your computer and have a beautifully typed manuscript come out the other side. And as you know, uh, these things both have been very slow in the realization. The latter is just now beginning to occur, in fact, over the last few years. And this reflects the fact that doing this analysis is, in fact, tough. That sounds like, for example, the though I are melded together into a continuum. There's no way that you can see distinct syllables there. It's very hard for a computer to dig this out of the noise and make sense of it. So what I want to talk about today, then, is the way in which our ear does this job, the way in which it takes these arbitrary syllables and breaks them down, analyzing the different frequency components, and then reconstructs the sound, reconstructs the idea, based on that analysis of frequencies. To do that, I need first to introduce the way the whole human hearing organ works. Sound, of course, consists of alternating compressions and rarefactions in the air outside the ear. Those impinge upon the eardrum, or tympanum, and set it into oscillatory back and forth motion. And that motion is then transferred through three little bones of the middle ear, the malleus, incus, and stapes, or hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And the last of these bones, the stapes, undergoes a piston-like back and forth motion, alternately compressing and rarefying the fluid in the coiled, snail-shaped cochlea, which is the actual hearing organ. Now, if we look at the cochlea by cutting across it anywhere along its length, we find that it's more complicated than a snail's shell. A snail's shell, of course, has just a single fluid-filled tube. In this case, at any level of section, the cochlea consists of three fluid-filled chambers running spirally along its length. And those three fluid-filled compartments are separated from each other by two elastic partitions, this one and this one. And the one I'll focus on in particular is this lower one. It's called the basilar membrane. And on it sits the organ of Corti, which, as you'll see in a few minutes, has in it the hair cells. So the hair cells in this organ form a strip. There's 16,000 cells in four rows running abreast along the entire length of this spiraling structure. Here's a conceptual notion of the way in which the organ would seem to work, at least at the very simplest level. <clears throat> Let's imagine that we could unroll the cochlea into a straight object and further simplify it by discarding one of the tubes and having only two fluid-filled tubes separated from each other by a single elastic partition called the basilar membrane. When the sound pressure outside the ear increases, that pushes the eardrum to the right. That motion is communicated through the bones and culminates in an increased pressure here in the upper compartment. That, in turn, would push the basilar membrane, which is elastic, downward. And the increased pressure in the lower compartment would be relieved by an outward bulging of this elastic diaphragm called the round window. Similarly, when the sound pressure outside the ear decreases, the eardrum would, in effect, be sucked to your left, the bones would move to your left, and the basilar membrane would be pulled upward. So if you listened to a pure tone of sound, you might suppose that the basilar membrane would then go into some sort of an up and down oscillation along its length, just like a plucked guitar string. 
But what really happens is, in fact, a, a good deal more complicated than that, because unlike a guitar string, this basilar membrane is not isotropic. It's not physically similar along its entire length. Whether at one end, at its apical or top end, it's relatively wide, relatively thin, and quite floppy. And at the other end, the basal end, it's narrower, but it's thicker in this dimension, and it's a good deal more taut. So the basilar membrane is really like a string that varies continuously along its length, from the lowest string on a bass to the highest string on a violin. And corresponding to that, if we stimulate the system with different frequencies of sound, we find different patterns of oscillation. So if, for example, we stimulate with a low frequency sound, such as 100 hertz, we find that the pattern of oscillation is confined just to this apical portion of the basilar membrane. If instead we stimulate with the highest frequencies we can hear, 10,000 or 20,000 cycles per second, we find that the oscillations are here towards the base of the cochlea. And if we stimulate at a frequency in between, such as 1 kilohertz or 1,000 cycles per second, we find an intermediate position. In fact, there's a very elegant, continuous, and in fact logarithmic map of sound frequency along the length of the cochlea. So this would represent the lowest tones, 20 cycles per second, this the highest, 20,000, this would represent 2,000, this would represent 200, and so on. Still more impressive is the performance of the cochlea when it's confronted with a complex sound. You've seen that something like my voice consists, say in vowel sounds, of multiple pure tones that are mixed together. Well, what happens then? Well, that's shown down here. A sound like a vowel will cause independent oscillations at several different points along the length of the basilar membrane, each of which represents a pure sinusoidal component of my voice. So this would represent a relatively low, this a middle, and this a relatively high frequency. And in each instance, the amplitude of the sound, would, uh, the amplitude of the basilar membrane motion would be a signal of the strength of the sound component, and the position would, of course, signal the frequency itself. So this is the beginning of what is called a tonotopic arrangement within the auditory system. That is what's also called pitch by place. Each individual pitch or tone of sound is represented in a specific place along this continuous representation. As Helmholtz first pointed out, something like the basilar membrane in effect undoes the work of musical instruments. In the case of something like the piano, <clears throat> there are a number of independent strings each of which produces a more or less pure tone. And when they're struck in concordance, those various tonal components will be mixed together to produce the richness of a chord. The cochlea accepts that chord and then undoes the work by basically representing where each of the tones occurs at a different position and signaling the nervous system in proportion to the different tones that are present. Now, the complexity of this uh, is uh, is not so great in a very simple demonstration like that, but I want to point out how terribly complex it is when you listen to stimuli in the real world. And to do that, I'd like to roll the uh, videotape, if I could, please. So here we are with a view of the cochlea. The cochlea now uncoils, and we look at the basilar membrane, and now see what happens when we play individual tones. Now a chord. And finally, something really complex. what happens. Uh, it, it is an amazing thing, and it's astonishing to believe that this is going on all the time in your ear. So what happens when this oscillation then occurs? At each little increment of the cochlea, and we're now looking across the basilar membrane, cutting opposite the direction I've shown you before, as each little increment of the cochlea bounces up and down, as we see schematized here, it carries with it the associated rows of hair cells. 
those hair cells have their hair bundles, the receptive apparatus, thrust up into a gelatinous structure called the tectorial membrane. And so you can appreciate that this up and down motion will also be accompanied by a shearing or back and forth motion. Basically, just as this pointer between my two hands moves side to side as my arms swing up and down, the hair bundles will be tweaked back and forth. And that, as I mentioned to you on Tuesday, is the proximate stimulus that excites each of these cells. So each cell then says, yes, I hear a sound. And by knowing where this particular cell is along the length of the basilar membrane, we know what frequencies are present. This information can then flow from the hair cell along nerve fibers and into the brain. Again, in that projection, in that set of nervous connections, there is a rigorous tonotopic ordering. So the low frequency hair cell sends its information along a nerve fiber that's dedicated to that particular frequency of 20 hertz. The highest frequency sends its along a nerve fiber dedicated to 20 kilohertz, and so on logarithmically, logarithmically mapped for all the nerve fibers in between. So listening down here at the brain end, if you get a strong signal from this particular nerve fiber, then you know exactly that it happened to come from, let's say, two kilohertz stimulation. And by the rate of firing of the nerve fiber, you can notice that the firing tends to be in phase with the stimulus. So in other words, the, the firing mimics the pattern of stimulation. So the fiber goes pop, 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 with sort of staccato uh, galloping beat following the stimulus. And finally, when the stimulus becomes very strong, the hair bundle is really moving, we have a saturated electrical response in the cell, and now the nerve fiber will be going burp, 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 as fast as it can go. So that will be occurring independently for each of the nerve fibers that I've showed you along the tonotopic map, each saying how much sound of a particular frequency is occurring. A brief reminder of the structure of the brain. <clears throat> the nervous system, the central nervous system, consists of the entire brain and the spinal cord. In the cerebral cortex of the brain, there is a representation of each of our major senses. So for example, the visual system uh, is represented back at the occipital or back end of the brain. The somatosensory system, touch, limb position, and so on, is represented in the cortex here. And the auditory cortex happens to occur in a little piece here on top of what's called the temporal lobe. Much of the auditory cortex is sort of around the corner behind the temporal lobe where we can't see it in this representation. So sound information comes from the cochlear nerve and it flows through the brainstem through a series of relay nuclei, something on the order of five or six of them, before the information finally impinges upon this primary auditory cortex where the initial stages of tone discrimination occur. From that point, the information fans out to a number, probably on the order of a dozen, other so-called accessory auditory areas. And some of those seem to be areas such as Wernicke's area that are thought to be involved in the recognition of speech sounds. Some also subsequently project to areas such as Broca's that's involved in the generation of speech itself. We unfortunately know very little about activity within these areas. For obvious reasons, human language is unique. There is no good experimental animal in which one can mimic human language, and ethical considerations prevent our being able to make any sort of recordings in these areas of the activity of individual nerve fibers. So we have to rely on what can be learned in other experimental systems to get some sense of what's going on. One thing we do know, though, in all these systems is the tonotopic ordering is highly preserved through the projections. So I pointed out already, there is a frequency representation in the cochlea. The high frequency elements there project to high frequency elements in the first relay nucleus, and so on in the second, all the way up to the auditory cortex. So in each of these structures, there will be a group of cells specializing in the highest frequencies, in the lowest, and in each intermediate one between. So again, if we take our demonstration of the piano and consider its various strings, the tones that each produces will be represented, say, on the cortical surface here by particular zones containing millions of cells each. If we pluck a particular string, such as this one, this particular band of cortical neurons will be excited, and it will then set up a sensation or a percept of that particular tone within the brain. Let me give you an example of the way that information is then used. As I said, we can't use humans for this experiment, but Nobuo Suga at Washington University has done elegant experiments using another animal that uses sound very effectively in its life, and that's the bat. Bats, of course, fly around detecting insect prey by sonar. They beam sound signals at the prey and then listen to the information that comes back. And a bat's voice, slightly modified, goes something like, eep, eep. The bat goes around making little pulses of that sort, of a constant tone, eep, and then whoop, which is a sweep of frequencies. The bat's voice has 
typically four major harmonic components, whereas mine typically for a vowel has two or three. The second highest frequency is the strongest as indicated by the brightness of this line. The others are somewhat weaker than that. What happens with this information? <clears throat> well, this is, this is, I should just point out the names of these. This is the constant frequency component, and this is the second harmonic, so it's called CF for constant frequency two. This would be CF one, two, three, four. This is the frequency modulated portion, FM one, two, three, four. So here we have my attempt at drawing bats, which was a difficult exercise. Um, and here are bats hunting. <clears throat> when a bat is hunting, it emits sound at a particular frequency. So here the sound wave comes and strikes this butterfly. And in this particular case, the butterfly is flying at the same velocity as the bat. It's an even contest between the hunter and the hunted. So what will happen is the sound wave will simply bounce off the bat. It will come back. The bat will detect it and say, yes, there's the butterfly, and I'll keep pursuing it. But let's consider what happens if there is a relative motion between the two. For example, if the prey is getting away, if the butterfly has accelerated to a point that the bat can't catch it, now what will happen is the sound pulse that's gone out, when it's bounced back, will be Doppler shifted. Remember, Doppler shift is the effect that you hear when a train passes you. As the train approaches, the frequency rises, as the uh, frequency of its whistle rises, and as it recedes, the frequency falls. The same thing happens here. A receding prey will cause a red shift or a shift to a lower frequency, and the bat will be able to detect that. Conversely, if the bat is catching up with the prey, as it might hope to, there will be a blue shift. The wavelength will get shorter, the frequency will get higher, and the bat will be able to detect that. So the bat's auditory apparatus is constantly designed to detect these very small Doppler shifts in the sound that is bounced back. Here is what the bat would actually experience. Here's the outgoing sound. Eep. Here come the four reflected sounds coming back off of a piece of prey. Okay. Now by the delay between the outgoing sound and the re returning sound, the bat, if it knows the speed of sound and still air and so on, can calculate how far away the prey is. So that's the first piece of information it might want. If the insect is flapping its wings, that will modulate the intensity of the sound and the bat can detect that. The bat uses this FM sweep basically to find out what the consistency of the prey is. If you think of the way our vision works, we see things in color by painting a scene with white light and asking which particular wavelengths are reflected back to us, and those define its color. In this case, the bat is painting its prey with white sound, with a range of different frequencies. And by asking which of those are well reflected, it can see what is the consistency of the prey and perhaps identify whether it's something that's tasty or something that it would just as soon avoid. And most importantly in this context, there is a shift in the frequency between that which goes out and that which, which comes back. That's in this case because of the Doppler shift. Here the returning echo has been shifted to a higher frequency. So the bat analyzes that in order to tell its velocity relative to that of the prey. And to do that, it has nerve cells that are dedicated to detecting this particular frequency, nerve cells that are dedicated to, protect, to detecting that particular frequency, and then other nerve cells that make a comparison between those two. And that, in many ways, resembles what we do when we perceive vowels. So here is a vowel. This is, in fact, the sound ka. Uh, so the ka has this consonant you learn to recognize. And then the ah part consists of these two continuous vowel sound frequencies. If we take a large number of observers, everybody in the room, and play different sounds to you, what we will find is if these two sounds which represent the first formant, this one, and the second formant, this one. If these two sounds have a certain ratio, we will say, aha, that is the sound, ah. But if that ratio is different, we will hear it as o, or u, or e, or e. And that's how you perceive vowels, just by comparison, comparison of these two relative frequencies. So it seems, in fact, that we already have some glimmering of how the nervous system will be doing this processing, though nobody has yet been able to make such recordings based on this elegant work on the back. Let's get on then with questions of how additional sorts of frequency analysis can take place. I've mentioned already the basilar membrane, which in our ears is one of the major ways in which sound is decomposed. But it's not the only way by any stretch of the imagination. It turns out that the individual hair bundles, these structures that detect sound, also are involved in their frequency analysis. And if I could have the lights up here for a second on the stage, you can appreciate how that might have come about. Each of these 
stereo, each of these hair bundles consists of a fascicle of stereocilia that are linked together. There's a certain mass associated with this structure. There's a certain elasticity associated with the bases. So if you were to pluck this device, it will tend to oscillate at a particular frequency. It acts just like a tuning fork, as does the table. Uh, <laughs> So in principle, a hair bundle itself ought to be capable of contributing to tuning. Now, the system is actually more complicated than that because this is, of course, oscillating in air, which is not very viscous. In the real world, the hair bundle is immersed in fluid all around, and that fluid will tend to dampen its oscillations. But at the same time, the fluid has a constructive effect, which is that as the hair bundle moves through the fluid, it tends to drag with it a mass of fluid that's viscously coupled. That mass of fluid accentuates the mass of the bundle itself, and in fact, lowers the resonant frequency and accentuates the resonance. That can be demonstrated by looking at a relatively simple air, such as that of a particular lizard, it's called the alligator lizard, that's shown in this electron micrograph. This cochlea, instead of being 30 millimeters long like ours, has a basilar membrane that's only about two or three millimeters in length. And it has only a few hundred hair cells whose hair bundles you can see here. And the nice thing about these is there's again a tonotopic representation. There are short hair bundles at this end, they're less than 10 micrometers high, and these cells respond to frequencies of four or five kilohertz. At the opposite extreme, there are long, thin hair bundles that you can see here. These are more than 30 micrometers in length, and the cells respond to frequencies below one kilohertz. It's possible then to do an experiment in which this entire organ is taken out and placed in a fine apparatus under an objective lens of a microscope. And then pressure changes are applied across the organ by means of a suitable stimulator, mimicking the situation in the intact lizard. And one can then observe with one's eyes or with an appropriate camera system the motion of the individual hair cells. When one does that, one finds that the hair cells, such as this one here, rock back and forth. There's a relative motion between the tip of the stereocilium and the base. And the difference between those two, this motion represents the angular excursion, the bending of the hair bundle. And as we already know, the bending of the hair bundle is the stimulus that then excites the cell. When one does the actual experiment, one sees, in fact, that the tuning fork mechanism is validated. If one plays a low frequency of sound, let us say one kilohertz, one finds that the long hair bundles oscillate quite nicely in response, but that the short hair bundles have little or no response. If instead one plays a frequency of four or five kilohertz, the, low, the long hair bundles are now insensitive, but the short hair bundles respond very nicely. This same mechanism seems to be operative in our own ears as well. As you listen to me now, the inner hair cells that you're listening with have hair bundles that range in length from about one to about eight micrometers. And again, they're disposed in a tonotopic map. So the highest frequency ones are one micron long. The lowest frequency ones are eight micrometers in length. Now, both of these types of mechanical tuning that I've described occur before the transduction process. There's also tuning that occurs after transduction, that is, after the mechanical stimulus has been captured and converted into an electrical response. And the striking tuning modality that occurs that way is electrical tuning that's illustrated here. This is an experiment in which we move the hair bundle of a cell back and forth as a function of time at an ever-increasing frequency of oscillation. So here we're moving at something like 20 cycles per second. Here we're moving at 200 cycles per second. If we simultaneously record the electrical response in a single hair cell, we see that low frequency stimulation produces little result above the noise. But as the stimulus gets higher and higher in frequency, the response grows until it reaches a peak at a particular range of frequencies. And higher frequencies still suppress that response. Now, the remarkable fact is that these cells show electrical sensitivity to that specific frequency to which they're most sensitive. It's a phenomenon first observed in the United Kingdom by Andrew Crawford and Robert Fetterplace. What they found is that if you take one of these cells, the same cell in this case, and pass current across its membrane, that the membrane voltage, the membrane potential, will oscillate, and it will oscillate at the same frequency to which the cell is sensitive when a mechanical stimulus is applied instead. So it seems that each hair cell has built into it a little electrical tuner that tunes it to a specific frequency and to no other. And of course, the different hair cells along the length of the organ then have to be tuned by a mechanism I'll discuss subsequently to different frequencies. We analyzed this tuning mechanism by isolating the cells and studying what happens when we pass a current pulse across the membrane. Again, an isolated cell shows very nice electrical oscillation. We were able to show that this oscillation is dominantly due to the flow of two types of ionic currents. When the hair bundle is stimulated, the entering uh, potassium ions make the inside of the cell more positive, 
they opened the first type of ion channel, which is a voltage-activated calcium channel that allows calcium to flow in. And this additional positive charge, of course, makes the cell ever more positive. But after a while, a certain amount of calcium accumulates in the cytoplasm. That calcium then interacts chemically with a different ion channel, a potassium channel. When calcium binds to it, it opens that channel and allows potassium to flow out. So that you can appreciate there's sort of a ping pong mechanism here in which positive charge first runs in, then out, then in, then out. And it's that back and forth motion of charge that causes the oscillation. The inward flux causes, is caused by calcium, the outward flux by potassium, calcium, potassium, and so on. And in fact, that model nicely explains the oscillations. These are experimental data, if you can see them up here, showing the oscillation. This is a computer model based on what I just showed you, which nicely recapitulates the actual experimental data. In effect, what the hair cell is doing is very much like what a transistor radio does. A radio has an antenna that picks up some really evanescent fraction of the total power output that's beamed from an antenna. The radio is highly tuned to pick up energy at only that one frequency. And the radio then has an amplifier that amplifies the output, in this case, millions of times before it comes out the loudspeaker. The hair cell listening to the loudspeaker does something similar. It has an antenna, which is a mechanical antenna, that picks up some really tiny amount of mechanical energy from the sound source. That then allows current to flow into the cell and triggers the activity of this amplifier that I just mentioned. And it turns out in this case that the amplification is about 10,000 times. So this is a powerful amplification mechanism as well as a strong tuning mechanism. Now, this mechanism sets an interesting constraint on the interaction between these two types of ion channels that I want to call to your attention, which is that for this mechanism to work, every time the membrane voltage oscillates up and down, a series of events must happen. First, the calcium channels have to open and let calcium flow in. Next, the calcium has to diffuse over to the potassium channels and bind to them. Thirdly, the potassium channels have to open so that potassium can run out. And finally, those channels then have to reclose, resetting the system so that the oscillation can occur again. This all has to happen on a rather brisk time scale. So if you're listening to 100 cycles per second, all of this has to occur on a time scale of 10 milliseconds. And if you're listening to 1 kilohertz or even 5 kilohertz tones, this all has to occur in 1 millisecond or less. But that sets an important constraint, because we know that the diffusion of ions from one place to another takes time. And as a rough and ready rule, to diffuse uh, one micrometer takes about one millisecond. So to listen to one kilohertz tones, these channels have to be a good deal less than one micrometer apart for this to work. One predicts, in fact, that the calcium and potassium channels had better be closely associated with each other. And it was possible to test that they are by this type of experiment in which we isolated individual hair cells and measured the current flowing across tiny patches of their membrane surface with the so-called patch clamp technique. We could, for example, take an electrode like this one and ask what ionic currents flow through the hair bundle. In that case, we found that in the hair bundle, there are no calcium channels and no potassium channels, only the mechanically sensitive channels that I introduced on Tuesday. If instead we bit off a little bit of the membrane from the basal surface of the cell and looked at that in the electrode, we saw in general two very distinct responses. Most of the time, nine times out of 10, such a patch of membrane would have no ion channels at all in it. But the remaining one time out of 10 or so, we would find a strong clustering of both calcium and potassium channels in that region. In fact, it was possible to infer that a patch of membrane of this size would contain about 90 calcium channels and about 40 potassium channels of the sort I'd been discussing. It was also possible to say that there are about 20 of these hot spots of ion channels scattered across the cell surface. So 90% of it has no channels, but the remaining 10% studded around has the channels in a concentrated way. If, in fact, the ca calcium channels are closely clustered together, it should be possible to detect their activity. It was pointed out by a number of people some years ago, prominently among them Robert Zucker on this campus, that if calcium channels occur close by each other, the local calcium concentration near the channels will be very high. It will be in the range of micromolar or even millimolar, which for calcium in the cytoplasm is an unusually high concentration. It's then possible to use calcium-sensitive molecules, so-called calcium indicators, that fluoresce when they bind calcium and to ask where the calcium entry occurs. So here's again an isolated hair cell lying on its side with the hair bundle over here. 
when we fill it with one of these calcium sensitive molecules and shine a fluorescent light on it, we can see bright spots such as the one here and the other one up here, which represent sites at which a lot of calcium is flowing into the cell and correspondingly being detected by that dye. We can then take a laser confocal microscope, basically a laser beam that sweeps back and forth rapidly along this axis and ask how much fluorescence occurs along this axis as a function of time, and that's plotted over here. So this is the time axis. This represents fluorescence along this particular arc, along this particular line. So when the membrane voltage is pushed in the positive direction, calcium flows into the cell. Concomitant with the calcium entry, there's a sudden strong brightening at this point of the membrane, and then the calcium signal you can see diffuses gradually into the cytoplasm, indicating that calcium is flooding in at this point, and then rather more gradually spreading out in the cytoplasm as a function of time. Uh, no. <clears throat> So the question then is what do these bright spots correspond to? And what you find when you examine the records more closely is that at, when the depolarization occurs, there is a brightening just under the membrane surface as well as a lesser degree of brightening due to the spread of calcium into the cytoplasm. If you take a region such as this where the brightening occurs and look at it in the electron microscope, you find that the brightening occurs at sites of synapses. Synapses, remember, are the sites at which the hair cell sends information to the uh, the nerve cell that is going to convey that information on into the brain. And at this type of chemical synapse, like those el elsewhere in the nervous system, there are so-called synaptic vesicles. These are little membrane bags that you see here in the electron microscope. Each of these membrane bags is filled with a neurotransmitter molecule, in this case glutamic acid. When the hair cell whose cytoplasm is up here, this just represents a, a, about a thousandth of the bottom of the hair cell. When the hair cell is stimulated, these little bags fuse with the surface membrane, as you can see here, and the glutamate molecules spill out. They then diffuse to the postsynaptic nerve fiber, which you see here, and excite it, sending information on into the brain. The site of synaptic release in the hair cell is endowed with this odd structure, the presynaptic dense body that you see very prominently here. And it's not known exactly what it does. The thought is that it's somehow involved in mustering vesicles to be released, that it's like the magazine of a Gatling gun or something of this sort that feeds vesicles down here to be released in order that the system can respond at the maximum possible velocity. So it seems, in fact, that the ion channels are clustered in the membrane near this site. And interestingly, there's a technique in which you can fracture this membrane open and look at it. It's called the freeze fracture technique. And when you do that, you find that the same patch of membrane where the vesicles are clustered is endowed with about 130 large intramembrane particles. So it's very tempting to believe that these 130 particles represent the 90 or so calcium channels and the 30 or so, 30 or 40, I should say, potassium channels that we know occur at each of these hotspots. So this system very nicely shows why it's important that the particular positioning of these channels be as it is, that they occur next to each other in close proximity to allow the, uh, uh, the very rapid signaling between them that's necessary for high frequency responsiveness. I now want to push this electrical tuning mechanism a little farther, and I'll talk about work that's done in a different organ. This is the cochlear or hearing organ of the bird. The bird's labyrinth has this beautifully elaborate structure. I'll point out there are particularly elaborate semicircular canals, which, remember, respond to angular acceleration. And these are required because the bird, of course, has to navigate extremely well in three space as it flies around. The cochlea, if one cuts across it along its length, somewhat resembles that of the mammal, in that there's a basilar membrane here with hair cells sitting atop it, and then three fluid-filled compartments bracketing it. This organ has about 10,000 hair cells in it, and it's particularly simple and easy to study. The other thing that's nice about the organ is that it has, again, a rigorous tonotopic representation of frequency. So at this end, the apical or end of the hair bundle, the end of the organ, we find relatively long hair bundles and we find cells that are tuned to relatively low frequencies, in this case something like 50 cycles per second. At the opposite end, the cells are tuned to high frequencies up to 5 kilohertz, and again there's a continuous gradation in the hair cells tuning in between. This then raises the question of what features set that tuning. In other words, if I look again at this diagram, how can a cell right here know that it should be tuned to a particular frequency, let's say 800 hertz? What are the chemical or molecular properties that tune that cell to that frequency, this to a higher, and that to a lower frequency? 
we've examined the two types of ion channels that I've mentioned are involved in this process. First of all is the calcium channel. The calcium channel is shown schematically here as a long molecule that's threaded across the green membrane. And it resembles other calcium channels that are found throughout the nervous system. But it's specialized, it turns out, in having several particular insertions along its length, three unique insertions that other calcium channels don't have. And we believe and are now trying to confirm that these are involved in setting the specialized properties that these calcium channels have, most especially the fact that they're particularly fast in turning on and off. The more interesting channel is the potassium channel. If one looks at the potassium channel structure in these animals, one finds, again, there is a membrane that the potassium channel is threaded back and forth across the membrane some seven times. There's an additional portion of the channel hanging off into the cytoplasm of the cell. And this is known to be the region that binds calcium and makes the channel open and close. But the remarkable thing about these channels is they show extreme variability from cell to cell. If we take the same channel DNA from one cell and from the next cell, we don't find the identical molecule. We instead find that the DNA molecules and therefore the proteins that they encode vary along the length of the organ. There are in fact seven or even eight distinct sites. We identified seven and another group identified an eighth, eighth at which variation occurs. So for example, at this particular position at the end of the molecule, one can either have an end that is like this or an end that is like this, in which these different letters represent the amino acids in the 20 letter code that defines proteins. At the second site, there may be no amino acid or there may be this group, and so on down the list. At each of these sites, you can have one, two, three, sometimes now four different choices that could occur. I'll be talking at somewhat more length about choices at this particular site, three, where there can be no insertion or short insertion, SRKR, representing four particular amino acids. But the key thing about this is this permutation of different choices at different sites means that there could be literally thousands of different types of potassium channels. And it raises the question, are these different types of potassium channels in fact rigged? Are they tuned to participate in electrical resonance at different frequencies? So to, ask, to answer that question, we did electrophysiological experiments asking what is the sensitivity of the channels, for example, to the membrane voltage or to the calcium concentration. In each case here, we're measuring how much current flows through the channels as a function of one parameter or another. And we then asked whether those responses were affected by the nature of the splice variants. And I'm comparing only two of them here. In one case, the beige one, we're talking about a, a case in which the molecule has in the third position no insert. In the green case, we're talking about a molecule that has the four amino acid insertion SRKR at that site. And what one finds when one does the analysis is that there are, in fact, significant and consistent differences. That the voltage sensitivity, I won't go through the details of these parameters, but the voltage sensitivity that's shown up here and over here, and the calcium sensitivity, which are shown here and here, differ between the two. For example, the SRKR type has a lower uh, voltage sensitivity. It has a lower calcium sensitivity than does the type without the insert. These are not enormous effects, but remember this represents only one of the myriad sites of variation in the molecule. The next question is, do these different types of molecules occur at different positions along the cochlea? And that can be done, that can be examined by asking with a chemical test whether the hair cells contain a particular type of molecule or not. And here's the result of that test. If we look at the insertless variety, we find that the insertless variety occurs at a relatively high density near the cochlear base, that's the high frequency end, and at a somewhat lower concentration at the apex, the low frequency end. The SRKR type has the opposite distribution. It's very strongly represented at the low frequency apex and almost totally absent at the high frequency base. So in fact, these two variants are mapped along the length of the cochlea somewhat like this, the SRKR version being highest at the apex, the insertless version being highest at the base. We and others have then looked at the distribution of other splice variants and found that they have different distributions. So for example, the SRKR graph I've just showed you, here's another site four where something without an insert or with the insert IYF occur in patterns roughly schematized like this. Site five, again, two different variants with different distributions. So it seems quite probable that if you look at any particular distance along the cochlea, that potassium channels manufactured there will have a particular distribution of splice variants at the first, the second, the third, all the way through the eighth position. 
And basically these potassium channels are varying in a significant way that is correlated with the frequency of the hair cells in which they occur. So what we believe to be happening, and further experiments are now trying to confirm this, is that if you look along the length of the cochlea, you have a whole panoply of different types, of different flavors, different colors of potassium channels, each of which is subtly different from its neighbor in its electrical and its calcium sensitivity. And at a given position, a given hair cell will have a mixture of two or three kinds of these. And these potassium channels, in fact, have four subunits. So they may even mix and match different flavors of potassium channel within a single potassium channel molecule. The other question which hasn't yet been approached, but which is particularly fascinating, is how this information is set up. How do you tell cells at different positions along the length of the cochlea to be expressing these different types of channels? One supposes that there's some morphogen, there's some chemical substance that is present in a graded way along the length of the cochlea, and that the genome of each cell somehow reads out its position. So a cell right here says, aha, I have so much of the morphogen, that means I should turn on this particular set of spice variants and produce channels of this sort. But this all remains at this point speculative. It will be a wonderful system to try to work out the answers to this question. Now, in the last few minutes, I want to turn to the question of what can be done to deal with deterioration in hearing. I mentioned in the first talk that 30 million of us in this country have hearing problems. That costs our government, costs us all, about $60 billion every year in terms of clinical diagnosis, in terms of medical care, in terms of hearing aids, cochlear prostheses, in terms of special education, and particularly in terms of lost work potential. That impact, as I mentioned, stems from several different sources, from loud sounds, from hereditary deafness, from drugs, from aging, and so on. The impact of that deafness above and beyond the financial is enormous at the personal level, and it falls across all socioeconomic groups and all ages. For the young, particularly for children who are prelingual, who haven't yet developed speech, Deafness deprives them of their ordinary avenue of developing language skills and therefore all forms of symbolic communication. And it's now particularly important in pediatrics to make sure that young kids are properly diagnosed to make sure that their hearing is normal. If their hearing is not normal, they can then be dealt with by getting a hearing aid, by getting a cochlear prosthesis, by learning American Sign Language, and so on, so that they can exert their normal cognitive function and develop normally. For the elderly in our society, progressive hearing loss has long been a source of estrangement from friends, from the family, from the workplace. And it's, it's something about which our society has become much more acutely sensitive over just the last couple of decades. If you think back, those of you who were there then, just a generation or so ago, there was something considered vaguely funny about an elderly person sort of fumfering around not hearing what he or she had in the environment. This is now seen, contrary-wise, as something of a tragic sensory deprivation, and the society has really grown up in its sensitivity to it. The other thing that we've matured in is our sensitivity to people who wear hearing aids. There's nothing bizarre at all about the fact that one wears glasses. That hasn't been considered particularly quaint since 1710 or some such year. And in fact, more than half of you in the audience uh, have glasses on. But until very recently, people were stigmatized for wearing hearing aids. And it's a fact to his credit that Ronald Reagan was the first prominent public figure who wore a hearing aid in public and let himself be seen with it. At that time, that caused considerable uh, press and was seen as a controversial thing. But now it passes as being perfectly normal. Bill Clinton has two hearing aids, for all the good it does him. Uh, <laughs> And finally, for the, those of us in the middle years of life, or whatever you happen to consider me, any, any sudden acute hearing loss, which can occur as a result of viruses or of loud sounds, can be psychologically and psychiatrically devastating. It's often associated with profound depression, even with suicide. And in fact, rather strikingly, there is a higher incidence of these problems with sudden deafness than with blindness, which seems very strange for such visual animals. But Helen Keller, who knew both of these things, put it well when she said that blindness deprives us of our contact with things, but deafness deprives us of our contact with people. And it turns out that the daily, rather casual interactions we all have through our language uh, are terribly important in situating us within our families, within our interactions with neighbors in the workplace, and so on. And deprived of those, one feels a terrible sense of isolation and of, of disconnection from one's social milieu. The other thing that sound is constantly doing for us, and that hearing people fail to appreciate, 
until they've lost it, is it provides a distant early warning system. We're constantly aware of sounds around us as people come and go. We know that if there's a fire alarm, we'll hear it. We know if there's a fire engine coming down the street, we'll hear that and so on. And again, imagine what it would be like going through life without having that kind of modality, which is sort of constantly feeling around you and giving you warnings of things to which you ought to attend. So what can be done about these problems? I want to talk about the long term and the short term. First, the long term, one of the strongest hopes we have is that it will be possible to deal with the degeneration of hair cells, their loss for whatever reason, by regenerating the cells. <clears throat> here's a normal hair bundle from a human ear, in fact, and here's a similar hair bundle after exposure to very loud sounds. This is one in an experimental animal, showing what characteristically happens, that the hair bundle becomes disarrayed, the tip links are fractured, eventually the whole hair bundle degenerates, the hair cell dies, and in the human cochlea, these cells are not replaced. There is no mitosis or cell division to give rise to new hair cells. But there is hope that we can find ways of producing new hair cells by recapitulating the developmental scheme that gives rise to them in the first place. So in the developing chick's ear, over a series of days that are delineated here, ordinary cells, called supporting cells, which have just fine fuzz on their top, develop into hair cells by gradually growing this complex organ pipe array that constitutes the hair bundle. And there should be ways in which we can trigger our own supporting cells to undergo this pattern of regeneration. There's precedent for that because, in fact, lower non-mammalian animals can do so. This, for example, represents the, the ear of a chicken, which listened to too much loud music. This scar running across the band, uh, is a band across the middle here, represents a scar due to destruction of the hair cells in that region, which were totally killed. These are normal hair bundles on the normal hair cells over here. But you can see that only a few days after the sound exposure, there is a new tiny hair bundle erupting from the center of each of these cells. And if you look a week or so later, this ear will be intact. You will not be able to tell that it was ever damaged. So the hope is that we will be able to find chemical substances, mitogens, that cause supporting cells to mutate, uh, to, to mitose, to, to, to form new hair cells, and morphogenetic structures, mor morphogenetic chemicals that cause the formation of normal hair bundles. This is, in fact, I think, the most promising avenue we have for so-called regenerative uh, therapy of the nervous system. We all know that efforts are being made, for example, to deal with Parkinson's disease by injecting nerve cells into the relevant portion of the brain and hoping that those nerve cells or their precursors will differentiate, grow out connections, make appropriate synaptic connections, and restore normal movement to people who are afflicted by Parkinson's. But I will point out to you that those types of, uh, of regenerations are much more complicated than what we're asking here. Because in the case of the brain, it's necessary for a nerve cell to find its appropriate position, to grow processes, to make connections, and to somehow plug itself into a complex circuit. In the case of the cochlea, we're asking something much simpler. When the cochlea is intact, we have hair cells surrounded by supporting cells. The hair cells have nerve fibers that run to the brain. When the, the cochlea is damaged, the hair cells are destroyed, they're extruded from the epithelium, and the adjacent supporting cells then snap together to form a, a so-called scar. But what we can hope will happen is that some of these, hair, these supporting cells can be induced to undergo mitosis or cell division, producing new supporting cells, some of which will then differentiate into hair cells. And all that is then necessary is that the nerve fiber hovering nearby grow a few micrometers to reestablish a normal connection with the hair cell. And there's every reason to believe in the human that, as in the chicken, that that can be made to happen. The other modality, which is already effective, is a therapy based upon technology. And that's the use of the so-called cochlear prosthesis. And the cochlear prosthesis takes advantage of what I showed you at the beginning of the talk, namely the tonotopic organization of the nervous system. So again, the cochlea, when it's normal, has 16,000 hair cells, each connected to specific nerve fibers that carry information into the brain. And each nerve fiber is sensitive to a particular frequency of sound. In an individual who has lost most or all of his or her hair cells, no hearing is any longer possible, at least by the normal avenue. Because no matter how much the basilar membrane oscillates, there are no hair cells there to detect it. 
but imagine that you could go into such an ear and connect an electrode, a wire, to one of these nerve fibers and stimulate it. The brain would then perceive a high frequency sound. And so on, you could apply other wires to other nerve fibers, and by stimulating them in the proper way, just as playing on a piano, you would send a pattern of messages to the nervous system that could then be interpreted as a, a certain specific type of sound. And that, in fact, is what the cochlear prosthesis does. The cochlear prosthesis, and this is a rather antique one, but it's particularly easy to show, is a plastic molded object that coils in the base of the cochlea and goes about around one turn of the cochlea. And it has along its length a set of metal electrodes of one stripe or another, which are connected to fine wires that exit from the base of the prosthesis. When the prosthesis is in place, here cut in cross section, it sits just below the basilar membrane and the organ of cordy from which the hair cells have been denuded. But you can imagine now if current flows between these two wires back and forth like this, some of that current will stimulate these nerve fibers which will then carry information on into the brain and a person will hear a particular sound. So all that's then necessary is that a person wear a small object the size of this remote control that picks up sound from the external world, breaks it down into a dozen or so frequency components, then sends those up a fine wire to the frames of the eyeglasses. The signal is then beamed across the skin to an electrode array that excites the appropriate nerve fibers. Here's a diagram of that. <clears throat> this represents the uh, wire running from the sound decomposition box. Here are the antennas that broadcast across the skin. And finally, the wire or series of wires that lead down to the cochlear prosthesis and stimulate nerve fibers in this particular position. This device, uh, until not too many decades ago, was entirely hypothetical. Now it's very real. There are about 20,000 people in the United States now fitted with this cochlear prosthesis. These are people, for the most part, the vast majority, who were totally deaf, absolutely deaf, who now can hear again. Many of them can carry on normal conversations. Some of them can carry on telephone conversations. So the device is enormously effective. It's also exciting for those of us in neuroscience because it's by far the most effective piece of electronic prosthesis yet. It lends hope to the idea that we will eventually have ways of, for example, dealing with blindness by appropriate stimulation of the visual system or dealing with paralysis by some sort of controlled stimulation of nerve fibers and muscles. I want to give you a sense of how this cochlear prosthesis works by playing you an auditory demonstration. And what this is is a snippet of speech in which the full richness of the speech has been largely effaced, leaving only six frequencies of sound. So it's rather like what you saw in the beginning with the sonograms. We've taken most of the sonogram away, and we're keeping just little bits and snippets of it. And this is, of course, meant to represent what you would hear if you were listening with the prosthesis. Instead of having 16,000 cells and 25,000 nerve fibers, this is what would happen if you had only a few channels of stimulation. So if you would start the tape, please. So there's not much there. You can tell there are two speakers, but let's hear it now, 12 channels. So maybe you can start getting some of the words. Now 20 channels, which is the number in a contemporary device. What do you do? In this same banal conversation, now again, <coughs> with all. What are you doing? Oh, preparing a lecture. Howard Hughes Medical Institute is sponsoring four talks on sensory transduction. Is this year's holiday lectures? like a valuable way of acquainting students with interesting new results pertaining to the senses? It's a typical conversation, right? Um, <clears throat> so the point to be made is our nervous system is extremely good at digging 
signals out of this rather uh, fuzzy sounding maze of, of, of sounds. Uh, in fact, this is what our nervous system is doing all the time. There's something called the cocktail party effect that most of you probably know. When you're in a crowded room, something like a cocktail party, you're well capable of attending to the speech of a si certain single individual in whom you're interested, despite the fact that there may be dozens more people talking more loudly around you. And the same thing seems to occur with the cochlear prosthesis. We're very good at digging a signal out of the noise. Now, I also want to point out that this cochlear prosthesis is something quite controversial for the following reason. The deaf community is very concerned about the impact of the cochlear prosthesis, and you will see mention of this in the newspapers from time to time. And when one first hears this, it seems retrograde. It seems like a funny attitude, because here is something that's coming along that has an enormous chance of relieving what problems deafness causes for a large fraction of people. But there, there are subtleties to it. The deaf community is a real community. It's a deaf culture. And particularly since the Second World War, that culture has pulled itself up from a rather degraded position in our society, one in which its economic prospects were not good, its educational prospects were very weak. By its own work, and particularly through the use of American Sign Language, the deaf culture has really become very effective, well-educated, participating in the workplace. And it's rather like the advances in other cultures, the African-American, Chicano, and so on, over the same time period. The deaf culture and the deaf community are threatened, therefore, by this device. Because imagine, if you were a member of the deaf culture, if somebody now came along and inflicted upon you the, the prospect of your child being taken out of that culture. It's a little bit like saying, look, you're, you're white or you're black or you're yellow, but we can change that. Or, or, or you're, you're Catholic, you're Protestant, you're Jewish, you're Muslim, but medical technology can fix it. I mean, it's not something you want fixed. Th this is your personal identity, and it's very much that way with the deaf culture. It is a culture, and it's something that's very dear to the, the very real soul of people who have this condition. So it's not foolishness that these people are concerned. They should be concerned about it. And it's necessary to find ways of reconciling the use of a cochlear prosthesis uh, and giving uh, families choices about using the prosthesis, but at the same time not having people hide from the opportunities that the cochlear prosthesis offers. It's also a vexatious issue because we don't really know yet what the impact of putting a cochlear prosthesis in young children is. The initial tens of thousands that were used for ethical reasons were put into people's ears who had no hearing at all because in that case they had nothing to lose. Now we're getting to the point at which the device is sufficiently proven that a, a trained physician can implant it in somebody who has severe but not total hearing loss or can implant it in young children. We don't know yet what that implanting will do for the young children. The concern that many people have concerns a so-called critical period, something that Carla Schatz works on. And that is it's well known in the visual system, for example, that if the visual system is not wired up properly in the first few years of our lives, it's not capable thereafter of reversing any mistakes. That's the reason, for example, people who have so-called lazy eye, amblyopia, or uh, strabismus, I'm sorry, will have the eye patched and have surgical correction to bring the eyes in line. Line. Because if that isn't done, one eye will simply be disconnected in the brain and can never be reconnected beyond its critical period. So the supposition is the same thing may well happen in our speech centers. If children don't recognize language, if they don't learn how to interpret sound at an early age, they may, but I'm not saying that they are, but they may well be incapable of doing so at later stages. There are even signals that the brain is, in fact, permanently influenced by uh, these types of inputs. And I'll close by showing you an illustration of that. This is from a recent work in the Japanese group using functional magnetic imaging, which is a technique for looking at brain activity. So this is an individual, uh, this is the brain from an individual who had been deaf from an early age and had used signing for his entire life. If one takes this individual, here's the front, these are the two eyeballs, this is the back of the brain, this is the brain stem. If you give this person ordinary optical stimulation, a magazine or what have you, one would find this blue pattern of activity indicating normal vision. If you give this person extremely loud sounds, which he can hear, one finds a very limited pattern of activation due to auditory stimulation, which is this little green dot here, and again the little green dot over here. Normally, however, that pattern of activation will be much broader, spreading into the adjacent areas that I said represent the auditory accessory cortex where language processing and so on are thought to occur.
In this individual, if you instead show him signs, that is, hand signs for sign language, you find that those ordinarily auditory act areas are activated by the signing. So a visual stimulus, not represented back here, but represented in what should be an auditory area. So the brain, by long-term exposure, seems to have transposed, if one takes this at face value, the language faculty from what would ordinarily be an auditory area into what has now become a visual modality. And we have to be concerned that this type of plasticity may be possible early in life, but not later on. What I should say in closing is obviously there, there are solutions to the problem. If one's own child had this difficulty, in, in my case if a child did, I would say do both. There's no problem with being bilingual, just as one can be bilingual in English, French, Spanish, or whatever. A person can do perfectly well learning American Sign Language, being an active member of the deaf culture, but at the same time having the implant and taking advantage of the possibility that he or she will then gain the neural connections that are necessary for the interpretation of sound. So I thank you all for your attention. I, I, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be happy to take questions as well. So the question is, could the molecular tuning of ion channels, for example, or for that matter, the height of the hair bundle, which makes the tuning fork, could that tuning be done in some way in response to feedback to mechanical stimuli? For example, could the basilar membrane first tune the system to a rough approximation and then finer tuning be superimposed? And I think that's a very real possibility. I would not be surprised at all if the system is constantly retuning itself so that the chicken or the human every day is adjusting its hair cells' heights and adjusting adjusting its hair cells electrical apparatus to stay in appropriate tune. How you do that, what feedback would be required to do it, is hard to understand. And it's also difficult to approach experimentally, but we're trying to do so. Yes. Right, so the suggestion is if an animal were deprived of sound input, it would in fact not have proper tuning. The animal, for example, turns out animals do things we don't think about. Um, the animal that's most often used in these studies, as I mentioned, is the chicken. And you might suppose, okay, just wait, keep the chicken in a quiet place and don't let it hear any sounds. It turns out the chickens are already capable of hearing in the egg for several days before birth. The chicken and the hen, the chick and the hen, actually engage in a conversation. The, the hen begins to hear the chick scratching around before it's ready to hatch. It sends signals, I don't know what it says, stay cool or whatever. Uh, it, it keeps the chicken calm in the egg until it's appropriate to hatch. So the, the system is a little harder than you might suppose to, to deprive from any sound because the animal will hear its own scratching and other things going on around it for days before it's born. But th that, that's a possibility. The other possibility which we're pursuing is to do this in vitro. That is to remove the developing ear from a young animal and put it in a really quiet environment and ask when the ear then develops if it will develop normally and does it have the tuning and we don't know yet. Yes. That's exactly what, in fact, happens. So if you look at the sensitivity of a given hair cell, can we have the slides off, please? We'll try this obnoxious device again. We'll pray, pray for help. Yes, good. If we look and make a map at the sensitivity of cells versus the frequency or the logarithm of the frequency, what we would find is that if the frequency range runs from, say, 20 to 20,000 cycles per second, a given cell, whether it is a hair cell or a nerve fiber, has a so-called tuning curve that looks like that. It isn't razor sharp sensitive to just a particular frequency. It has a broad range of sensitivity. And there are then an ensemble of these. The 16,000 represents 16,000 different curves of this sort. I'll point out the similarity of this to vision 
you well know, if you look at vision using, again, frequency or wavelength, you have three different pigments which represent sensitivity to red, to green, and to blue. And you see colored objects by comparing how much they're absorbed by two or three of those different mechanisms. Here, similarly, a given frequency of sound will stimulate different of these cells to different proportions. And the nervous system can then look at that ensemble and say, yes, that's a middle C. It's a pure middle C. There's a little bit of G flat or whatever as well. And the relative weighting of the two is as follows. The typical bandwidth of the functions, it depends, of course, how they're defined. But you can define something that's called the Q10 dB. That means the width in proportion to the frequency for attenuation of 10 decibels. It's just the technical mnemonic, the technical uh, rubric that's used. And that's typically in the order of a few hundred. So it's a relatively high Q, relatively sharply tuned system. But there would be enormous overlap, as you can see, if you had 16,000 of these functions. You can also see why things like uh, hearing aids work while we're at it, which is, let's suppose that you start out <coughs> with thousands and thousands of these. You now have very nuanced hearing for any particular stimulation for any frequency along that length. But as these cells begin to die off, you're going to get into a condition in which some of these survive, but others don't. So you will now be relatively insensitive to sound here and here. You'll lose discrimination, and you may even uh, have such a depression of your sensitivity that you can't hear at all. And using a hearing aid, of course, simply augments the sound so it stimulates more strongly and now begins to recruit a response from these adjacent cells, which are tuned to somewhat different frequencies. I would answer other questions if I could see anything. Maybe somebody is over there. Yes? Yeah, th that's a relatively common thing, that, that as, we, as we age or as we lose hearing for whatever reason, let's see if we can leave this up, our normal hearing function extending from 20 to 20 kilohertz looks something like this. So this is the response of all of the hair cells put together. We're most sensitive in this middle range. We're less sensitive at low and at very high frequencies. And what happens with time is that we tend typically to lose the high frequencies first. So I'm down here now. I can hear to about 12 kilohertz. I can no longer hear the obnoxious whine of television, even if we had a television, and uh, can't hear those high frequencies anymore. But uh, can still hear fine below that point. Now, what happens if you use a hearing aid to try to augment sensitivity out in this region? If you crank it way up, you begin to stimulate so strongly that presumably you're damaging cells over here, that you're spilling sound energy over into intact portions of the ear and beginning to do harm. So there really comes a point at which a hearing aid is simply more uh, of a bother than it is a, an aid. And there is speculation, in fact, that it promotes additional hearing loss. That's why one is encouraged to keep the hearing the hearing aid uh, at as low an intensity as is possible. I should mention one other thing while I've got this diagram here, because you've seen the sonograms and you can appreciate it, and that is we're all familiar with people who are somewhat, quote, hard of hearing, who uh, don't seem to be picking up things well, but if you shout at them, they find it offensively loud. And you can now appreciate why that is occurring. Because remember, I showed you before in the sonogram that if I say, sang in my chains like the C, okay, that the ch sound and the s sound at the end of chains have a large representation at high frequencies. So in fact, this is what's wearing away. We're wearing away our high frequencies, so people are successively losing this information. It's gradually being submerged. Therefore, as soon as a hearing loss, mine or anybody else's, gets down to the point at which sibilant sounds begin to be truncated, then you begin to become hard of hearing and have a hard time making things out. Yes, sir? Thank you. 
Yes, and in fact, that's now done. So the reason hearing aids are so much better now than they were, there, there are two reasons. They're, they're much smaller, they're cosmetically less problematic because many of them are in the canal devices like Clinton's that you don't even see at all. But the other thing that's the technical advance is they are now individually contoured. So when one gets a hearing aid fitted, a good quality hearing aid, it is adjusted so that it amplifies only the sounds that you need amplified and does as little amplification as you can achieve in the sound frequency range in which you have reasonably intact hearing. Yes, so efforts have been made of that sort to try to use other modalities uh, to compensate for deafness. One could use a visual modality. The other thing that's been tried with, I would say, modest success is actually tactile. So you can imagine, and people have in fact made, devices that have a series of contacts the size of the end of this pen on your skin. And the, the back skin of the back was used for this, but basically an array with, say, 10 by 10 little pushing rods, 100 of them. And then you could learn that when this particular set of them are pushing against your skin, that means I hear a certain vowel, this a certain consonant. You can basically map frequency onto the body surface. Such devices have been made, uh, but the, for whatever reason, the nervous system does not seem to be particularly adept at interpreting those signals. Um, well, I mean, I mean, it is surprising. In, in the case of the hand signs, as I showed you, it seems that that hand signing has been plugged into the language module quite effectively. In American Sign Language, as anybody who's seen it in action can attest, is now as fast as spoken speech. It's as sensitive, it's as nuanced. It's now being studied by linguists as an independent language because it is not English, it is ASL. But for whatever reason, the somatosensory system does not seem to be capable of that commingling as effectively, and we can't say why. Yes? So, so I you should make a confession about the electrical tuning and where it is and is not found. The electrical tuning has been extensively studied in fishes and amphibians, in reptiles and in birds. Its role in the mammal is still somewhat unclear. There, mammalian hair cells clearly have the calcium and the potassium channels, and they clearly shape the electrical response in the low frequency range, as you suppose, up to about five kilohertz. But we don't see the florid resonance that we can see in other animals. And we don't yet know if that is simply because the mammalian cells are more fragile and have been compromised in the experiments, or whether they don't have that much resonance. But you're quite right. Above about five kilohertz, I think the electrical resonance is very hard to imagine how it can work, because the diffusion of calcium, the binding and unbinding as I argued, seems to set an inexorable limit beyond which we can't go. And the best evidence suggests that at those higher frequencies, it's a mechanical tuning, and a mechanical tuning probably enhanced by the oscillation of the hair bundle that I mentioned in the previous lecture. Yes, sir? That is definitely the case. So in fact, that tonotopic mapping that I've showed you several times connotes exactly uh, what you're saying, that if you look along the length at the 16,000 or however many hair cells and X thousand, 25,000 nerve fibers, each of those is acting as, a, as, as an independent channel and each of them is acting independently the first order of the others. There is crosstalk. The basilar membrane is not entirely linear and what have you. But the first order, you have 25,000 independent channels. So the thing about which we still know very little is how this information is combined at the other end. How does the central nervous system take this complex and constantly changing temporal array of excitation patterns and from it infer that we've heard a particular constant or a particular vowel or whatever. And only the very simplest cases, such as the bat's vowel detection, do we have a glimmering of how that might be done. Yes? Right. 
So, so the, question, the question is how bats can respond to phase differences down in the microsecond range. And to a certain extent, I answered that question in the previous lecture in talking about how humans can range sound lo, lo, loci in space, where our sensitivity is estimated between uh, 10 and 20 microseconds. So it's not quite as good as the bat. There's one other thing that I haven't told you, though, that is important in this regard. Each of these nerve fibers, if we record from it, as you just implied, can fire at most about every millisecond. You can fire 500 or 1,000 times per second. So you would suppose that the system at most could carry information about signals up to about one kilohertz, but not much faster than that, or intervals of the order of a millisecond, but not much more. But in fact, the real innervation pattern in the human of a cochlear hair cell is that a single inner hair cell actually has 20 independent nerve fibers running from it. So it's a 1 to 20 array, unlike anything else you see in the nervous system of which I'm aware. And it's tempting to believe that these 20 fibers, in effect, increase the temporal resolution of the system. It's as though we have 20 different uh, A to D converters taking the information, analog to digital converters, taking the information from the hair cell. So while one cell might only be able to fire like this, another cell, its next door neighbor, might be firing like this, a third cell firing in a different pattern with the potential for much finer temporal resolution between them. Again, the real problem is how does the central nervous system dig that information out of this patterned array? Anybody else out there? You say, yes. Right. And, it's not that I, I dislike inner and outer hair cells, but they're questions of time. But very briefly, the, the remarkable fact is this. I said you have 16,000 hair cells in a cochlea that you're doing your hearing with. It's actually worse than that. You have only 4,500. There are 4,500 of the inner hair cells in a single row along the cochlea along the basilar membrane. And then there are three or so rows of the so-called outer hair cells constituting the remainder, about 12,000, of the total of 16,000. And remember, these have their hair bundles thrust into this gelatinous tectorial membrane. Now, these two cells seem to be quite specialized in what they do. The inner hair cells, as I mentioned, have as many as 20 independent afferent nerve fibers carrying information from them into the brain. The outer hair cells send almost no afferent information, at least none that anybody attributes uh, any significance to. They, in contrast, get information coming from the central nervous system in the opposite direction, so-called efferent stimulation. And that efferent stimulation is known to control the sensitivity of the system. I mentioned previously that the sensitivity as a function of frequency of a single nerve fiber, for example, roughly looks like that as a so-called tuning curve. If we activate this efferent system, one finds that the tuning becomes less sharp and less frequency discriminated. So the outer hair cells are somehow involved in amplification and sharpening. And the question is how that's done. There are two competing hypotheses. One is that if these cells are isolated in a dish, and an electrode is applied to one, depolarization causes it to contract, hyperpolarization to extend. So one notion is that stimulation of these cells causes them somehow to flinch like little muscles, and that that somehow pumps more energy into the cochlea. The other notion is the one that I presented on Tuesday, which is that stimulation of these cells causes active motion of their hair bundles. And we know that that active motion occurs in the lower animals, such as amphibians, reptiles, and birds. It is not yet known whether it plays an important role in mammals. So the broad take-home lesson is this. Th this cell does your hearing, and, and these cells in a row of 4,500 are tuned to the specific frequencies. But this is the amplifier. These three cells working in concert, by one means or another, augment the oscillations in the ear so that we are more sensitive than we would be without them by a factor of 100 times, or 40 decibels. And in fact, this seems to be one of the first things that deteriorates when our hearing begins to go. People become hard of hearing, but can still discriminate various tones because they've lost the amplifier. It's somehow blown out. But they're 100 times less sensitive, but they're still capable of some hearing with the surviving uh, inner hair cells. Yes, way at the back. Yeah, 
that's actually a nice illustration of the sort of processing that goes on in the brainstem and that we're unaware of all the time. I mentioned the brainstem does a lot of fancy processing very rapidly. I showed you an example of sound localization in space. But there's another very good example, which is the one you just mentioned. If I make a loud sound in this room, ouch, uh, you, you can hear an echo. Right, and we're all familiar with that. And you're hearing basically a particular sound. It's going and hitting the wall and coming back and you're hearing it again, okay? The question is, why don't you hear an echo when you're in your office? If you're in a small room, a quarter of this size, and you clap your hands in a similar way, and the walls are bouncy enough, you should hear an echo there as well. Why don't you? And the answer is that you do. That is, that the sound, if you measure it with a microphone or if you measure activity in the cochlear nucleus, the echo's there. The sound wave hits the wall, it comes back, and you hear everything a second time. But there's a suppressive mechanism in the brainstem, a gate, so that if a particular pattern of sound input comes in, that portion of the nervous system then looks at the next few milliseconds and says, if it sees the same thing again, that's an echo, it shuts it off. It suppresses, makes a little window of silence in which it doesn't listen to the next little piece. So you're right, you do hear things at least peripherally more than once, but the central nervous system suppresses it. Only if you're in a very large room and the delay becomes too great, it falls outside the window of suppression and then you hear the echo. Carla, I think we've had it. Yeah, the, the Takata and Fugue piece is a portion of a large fugue by myself. Yeah. <laughs> you can get them free from Howard Hughes, so. 